Oh, hello, folks. You know what this book is? I'm thumping. It's, it's my Bible. Yeah. This is my Bible. I've had it like this since 1984. 84, 90, 2000. 33 years. <gasps> She'll alert. I just said the number 33. I'm oh, sorry. sorry. All right. Look at that. That's my Bible. This is my old Bible. I've been through this thing many times. In fact, I indexed this whole thing. If you can see those lines on there, I indexed it, put topics so I could give talks. You know, I used to speak in front of hundreds of people at the drop of a hat. I had everything marked with tabs. They're glued in. I've been through this book. Well, I can't even say how many times. But what is this book? Where does it come from? What is it made of? Who who made it? You know, most people that are Christians. Uh, I was born and raised as a Bible Christian. You know, I grew up with this thing. And uh, most people that know about it and read it, and you find people that go to church. Doesn't matter what Christian religion you know, whether it's Catholic or any of the Protestant religions. They've got a Bible. Uh, this is King James, or they've got a version of the Bible. And they will read from it and tell you and preach from it. And every word I swear to you is the word of God. Today we're going to talk about that question, okay? Uh, is the Bible completely the word of God? Every word in it, was it given to you? You know, some people can say, well, you can give me the history of, you know, Rome and Constantine and the Vatican. But the fact that it's in our hands means that this is what God wanted us to have, and therefore it is the Word of God. Is that true, if you believe that? I don't know. I don't think so, personally. But uh, what I'm going to do today, folks, is read to you. We're just going to skip through. I found a really interesting article. Let me uh, switch over here to this. There's a book out called The Bible Fraud, published in 2001. It's by a man named Tony Bushby, an Australian. Okay, uh, this is an excerpt uh, article taken from Nexus Magazine. That's at www.nexusmagazine.com. Um, books of The Bible Fraud are available from joshuabooks.com. I'll have the link below, www.joshuabooks.com. Uh, you can write it down from here. Let's see. What the church doesn't want you to know. It's often been emphasized that Christianity is unlike any other religion, for it stands or falls by certain events which are alleged to have occurred during a short period of time some 20 centuries ago. Folks, a century ago, that is a house on the astrology chart, basically. 2,000 to 2,100 years. That's basically the what we call the Piscine or Piscean era which is the symbol of the two fishes, which is the epoch since Jesus Christ, who performed the miracle of the two fishes. Remember that. We're going to talk about that later. Uh, we're going into Aquarius now. I picked my channel name, Aquarius, because we're going into a new 2,000-year uh, period where we're going to have a whole new knowledge base. And I think the man bearing the pitcher of water that's poured out among the people is the knowledge that's coming out. Like right now, we're on the internet sharing these things. Uh, the knowledge is being poured out upon the face of the earth. So let's see where we're at. Those stories are presented in the New Testament, and as new evidence is revealed, it would become clear that they do not represent historical realities. Um, Church agrees, saying our documentary sources of knowledge about the origins of Christianity and its earliest development are chiefly in the New Testament scriptures, the authenticity of which we must, to a great extent, take for granted. Um, some 350 years after the time of the church claims that Jesus Christ walked in the sands of Palestine. Okay, and here's the true story of Christian origin slips into one of the biggest black holes in history. There is, however, a reason why there were no, test, no New Testaments until the 4th century. They were not written until then. And here we find evidence of the greatest misrepresentation of all time. It was British-born Flavius Constantinus, Constantine, 
who authorized the compilation of the writings now called the New Testament. After the death of his father, uh, let me just stop here. We're not going to go over the Old Testament because that's basically came from the Jews. It's based on the Talmud, the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And uh, the Talmud, and what's the other one? The Torah. Uh, some of those writings, mostly the Talmud. Okay, after the death of Constantine's father in 306, he became the king of Britain, Gaul, and Spain. Okay, that's UK, France, and Spain. Then after a series of victorious battles, emperor of the Roman Empire. I never knew Constantine was British. I guess I'd known that and I forgot. I just, I thought he was Roman or uh, from that region around Turkey where Istanbul is, which was Constantinople. The majority of modern-day Christian writers suppress the truth about the development of their religion and conceal Constantine's effort to curb the disreputable character of the presbyters who are now called the Church Fathers. Okay. Um, the peculiar type of oratory expounded by them was challenged to a settled religious order. Ancient records reveal the true nature of presbyters and the low regard in which they were held has been subtly depressed by modern church historians. In reality, they were the most rustic fellows teaching strange paradoxes. They openly declared that none but the ignorant was to hear their discourses. They never appeared in the cities of the wiser and better sort, but always took care to intrude themselves among the ignorant and uncultured, rambling around to play tricks at fairs and markets. They lard their lean books with the fat of old fables and still the less do they understand and they write nonsense on vellum and still be doing never done clusters of presbyters had developed many gods and many lords okay this is talking about presbyters the people who were running around in uh, this era between the death of uh, or let's say the life of Christ and uh, to say Constantine around 300 Okay, Constantine never acquired a solid theological knowledge and depended heavily on his advisors and religious questions. According to Eusebius, that was his main advisor. Constantine noted that among the Presbyterian factions, strife had grown so serious, vigorous action was necessary to establish a more religious state. But he could not bring about a settlement between the rival God factions. His advisors warned him that the Presbyters' religions were destitute of foundation and needed official stabilization. Constantine saw in this confused system of fragmented dogmas the opportunity to create a new and combined state religion, neutral in concept, and to protect it by law. When he conquered the East in 324, he sent his Spanish religious advisor, Osius of Cordoba, to Alexandria with letters to several bishops exhorting them to make peace among themselves. The mission failed, and Constantine, probably at the suggestion of Osius, then issued a decree commanding all presbyters and their subordinates to be mounted on asses, mules, and horses belonging to the public and travel to the city of Nicaea, which is Nietzsche, France today, Nicaea, in the Roman province of Bithynia in Asia Minor. They were instructed to bring with them the testimonies they already to the rabble, bound in leather and protection during the long journey. Okay, this, folks, is the famous council of Nicaea. In their writings, totaled in all 2,231 scrolls, the legendary tales of gods and saviors, together with the record of the doctrines orated by them. That's what they brought to the council, okay, to start with what would end up as the Bible. Okay, let's go down. There is another... Oh, this is funny. In an account of the proceedings of the conclave of presbyters gathered at Nicaea, Sabinius, bishop of Heraclea, who was in attendance, said, Excepting Constantine himself and Eusebius Pamphilius, they were a set of illiterate, simple creatures who understood nothing. That's from uh, Bishop J.W. Sergius from 1685. This is, another, this is another luminous confession of the ignorance and uncritical credulity of the early churchmen. Dr. Richard Watson, a disillusioned Christian historian and one-time bishop of Landaff in Wales, referred to them as a set of gibbering idiots. The clergy at the Council of Nicaea were all under the power of the devil, and the convention was composed of the lowest rabble and patronized in the vilest of abominations. 
an apology for Christianity. Okay, the church admits that vital elements of the proceedings at Nicaea were strangely absent from the canons. We shall see shortly what happened to them. However, according to records that endured, Eusebius occupied the first seat on the right of the emperor and delivered the inaugural address on the emperor's behalf. Okay. It was that puerile assembly, and with so many cults represented, that a total of 318 bishops, priests, deacons, subdeacons, acolytes, and exorcists gathered to debate and decide upon a unified belief system that encompassed only one God. By this time, a huge assortment of wild texts circulated amongst presbyters, and they supported a great variety of Eastern and Western gods and goddesses. Uh, here's a list of them. Love, Jupiter, Salinus, Baal, Thor, Gade, Apollo, Juno, Ares, Taurus, Minerva, Retz, Mithra, Theo, Fragapati, Addis, Durga, Indra, Neptune, Vulcan, Christi, Agni, Croesus, Pelides, Uit, Hermes, Thulis, Thamus, Aguptus, Lao, Af, Saturn, Gitchens, Minos, Maximo, Hecla, and Fernes. All right, let's go back. So what you get here, I'm not going to read all this in detail. It's not going to be that long. But uh, you're getting the idea of how many thousands of scrolls they brought, how many gods they worshipped and brought together. And they were supposed to sit down and come up with a universal religion for the whole empire of Constantine. Constantine's intention at Nicaea was to create an, an entirely new god for his empire who would unite all religious factions under one deity. Presbyters were asked to debate and decide who their god would be. Delegates argued among themselves, expressing personal motives for inclusion of particular writings that promoted the finer traits of their own special deity. Uh, howling factions, heated debates, the names of 53 gods were tabled for discussion. Okay, at the end of that time, Constantine returned to the gathering to discover that the presbyters had not agreed on a new deity, but had balloted down to a short list of five prospects. Caesar, Krishna, Mithra, Horus, and Zeus, okay? Now, if you look up the stories of the son born of a virgin, followed by 12 disciples, died, resurrected, it's, it, it's based on the astral theology uh, of the uh, winter solstice, you're going to find Krishna, Mithra, and Horus. And you'll even see Zeus in there. Zeus, by the way, is Suez, spelled backwards. Or vice versa. Constantine was a ruling spirit at Nicaea, and he ultimately decided upon a new god for them. To involve British factions, he ruled in the name of the great Druid god Jesus. Be joined with the Eastern Savior God Krishna, uh, which is Sanskrit for Christ. Christ means the anointed one. It refers to being anointed with oil, which is a third density ritual to be anointed with oil in this light body, in the third density. The vote was taken, and it was with a majority show of hands, 161 to 157, that both divinites became one god. Following long-standing heathen custom, Constantine used the official gathering in the Roman apotheosis decree to legally defy two cities, deities as one. And they did so by democratic consent. Isn't that convenient? How the Gospels were created. Constantine then instructed Eusebius to organize a compilation of a uniform collection of new writings developed from primary aspects of the religious text submitted at the council. My. Eusebius then arranged for the scribes to produce 50 sumptuous copies to be written. I knew it was 50 or 57 first original Bibles. Uh, Constantine believed that the amalgamated collection of myths would unite variant and opposing religious factions under one representative story. That's great. These orders, said Eusebius, were followed by the immediate execution of the work itself. We sent him magnificently and elaborately bound volumes of threefold and fourfold forms. With his instructions fulfilled, Constantine then decreed that the new testimonies would thereafter be called the word of the Roman Savior God. And the official to all presbyters sermonizing on the Roman Empire. Then he ordered earlier presbyterial manuscripts and the records of the council burnt and declared that any man found concealing writings would be stricken off from his shoulders, beheaded. In other words, as the record shows, presbyterial writings previous to the Council of Nicaea no longer exist except for some fragments that have survived. Oh my, what a story. So, over the centuries, Constantine's new testimonies were expanded upon. 
Interpolations were added in other writings. I know, for example, the book of Revelations did not exist in the Bible until hundreds of years later. Uh, the Latinized name for Apollo Apollonius is Paulus. Uh, let's see, the church hierarchy, the shock of... Oh, they discovered another text uh, that was one of the ancient Presbyterian Bibles. I'm not going to get into that. Ultraviolet testing of page in the hooker. Okay, now, forgery in the Gospels. When the New Testament and the Sinai Bible is compared with the modern-day New Testament, it's staggering. 4, 14,800 editorial alterations can be identified. These amendments can be recognized by a simple comparative exercise that anybody can and should do. Hmm. <laughs> they threw out Shepherd of Hermas, the Missive of Barnabas, and the Odes of Solomon. Solomon, by the way, is the word for the sun in three languages. On, Om, and Sol, which is Latin. It's sun, sun, sun. Could that be pagan? In origin? Let's see. It is apparent that when Eusebius assembled scribes to write the New Testimonies, he first produced a single document that provided an exemplar, a master version. Today it is called the Gospel of Mark, and the church admits that it was the first gospel written. Even though it appears second in the New Testament today, the scribes of the Gospels of Matthew and Luke were dependent upon Mark writing as the source and framework for the compilation of their works. The Gospel of John is independent of those writings, and the late 15th century theory is that it was written later to support the earlier writings, that the earlier writings is the truth. Um... Gospel of Mark in the Sinai Bible carries the first story of Jesus Christ in history, one completely different to what is in modern Bibles. It starts with Jesus at about the age of 30, doesn't know of a Mary, virgin birth or mass murders of baby boys by Herod. Words describing Jesus Christ as the Son of God do not appear in the opening narrative. And the modern day family tree tracing the messianic bloodline back to King David is non-existent. Uh, let's see. Despite the multitude of long, drawn-out self-justifications by church apologists, there is no unanimity of Christian opinion regarding the non-existence of resurrection appearances in ancient gospel accounts of the story. Not only are those narratives missing in the Sinai Bible, but they are absent in the Alexandrian Bible, the Vatican Bible, the Bezier Bible, and that must be Byzantine, uh, and the ancient Latin manuscript of Mark, codenamed K by analysts. They also are lacking the oldest Armenian version of the New Testament and the 6th century manuscripts of the Ethiopic version and 9th century Anglo-Saxon Bibles. However, some 12th century Gospels have now have the now known resurrection verses written within asterisk marks used by scribes to indicate spurious passages of literary document. I'm skipping over this article, folks, because you, you just get the main uh, message here of this video. What is the Bible? The great insertion and the great omission. The modern day versions of the Gospel of Luke have a staggering 10,000 more words than the same Gospel in the Sinai Bible. Six of those words say Jesus and was carried up to heaven. But this narrative does not appear in any of the oldest Gospels of Luke. Ancient versions do not verify modern day accounts of an ascension of Jesus Christ. And this falsification clearly indicates. So folks, it doesn't, earlier, earliest versions of the Gospel I believe the man existed, the man who was named Yeshua, Yehoshua, uh, Jesus, Emmanuel, Isa. He was known in India, Tibet, Persia, China, um, Egypt, Spain, Portugal. There was a man who traveled with his father, the carpenter, and had many journeys around the Mediterranean. He knew Greece. And a lot of these things he did before he was 30. And a lot of people say that when he died, or almost died, on the cross, when he was crucified, uh, he was put in the tomb, and his people brought herbs, like it says right in the Bible, that uh, Joseph of Arimathea brought uh, ointments and herbs to heal the Savior. Okay, So, uh, I'm not making this up. You look in the Bible, it says Joseph of Arimathea brought, I, I can't remember, 80 kilos of herbs and ointments and oils to heal a person. They were not products that you would use to embalm somebody. Another example that I've noticed from uh, when I studied the Bible that I thought of is uh, when Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene on the road after his uh, death and resurrection, he says, touch me not for I have not yet ascended to my Father in heaven. In the Bible. But 
if he was a real person that actually lived, that the story was based on to make it into Mithra, Tammuz, Horus story, then he was telling her, I haven't died. You know, I could get an infection. Don't touch me. If she was his partner. You know, there are a lot of stories. He was known as Isa, the one who was crucified in Jerusalem. And he's even got a place in Srinagar, India, where they say is his tomb where he lived. He was a grandfather. He lived to be, it was at 105, 108, or 115 years old. And he had traveled all around the world. He was actually crucified twice and survived both times, according to many stories. Okay, I'm not saying that I 100% believe this or you have to believe me. But just look, because if you look around the world and you look at Eastern traditions, history, Chinese monasteries have found the teachings of Jesus of when he visited there. And there's a book that came out in the 90s by some missionaries that were in China at a monastery. And the monks said, hey, do you want to see the teachings of Isa from when he came here and taught us? And they said, what? Jesus was here? And they go, yeah, we got his books. His scrolls are over here. Let's look at them. And they, they got them. Um, he was in, per there's, there's a good video called um, Gnosis, Jesus Beyond Belief, written by an ex-Catholic who just, his mind kept telling him Jesus was not crucified. He didn't die. There's no resurrection. If you look at the, uh, what we know now about spirit in the third density, being congealed into a body conformed by light from the 11th down to the 3rd. And we're trying to ascend back up with the experiences we have on this plane made for us by the deities, okay? These other beings that come here, they're from somewhere else in our solar system. And they're from different stars, which are a lot closer than they actually are. And I don't think they're suns either, okay? Um, but they have a God too, and they have a creator. If you go up to the 11th density and higher, that's where they are. And Jesus was telling a lot of people, I think the person who was walking around that this story was based on, I think there was an actual living being. It's not like Jesus was completely fabricated out of astrotheology, right? I think that the man that was Jesus, it was what he was teaching people, like when he said, you know, if you see me, you see the Father. You know, he was teaching people to raise their vibrations. When he, he spent time in Tibet, he was a yogi master. He learned how to walk on water. He performed miracles. Uh, things that you can find about theology, like when the when his disciples told him, uh, Master, after you're, you've gone, who do we look to follow? And he said, look for the man bearing the pitcher of water and go into his house. If that's not astrology, tell me what is. Okay, he's telling them. In astrology terms, when the house of Pisces is over with on the astrology wheel, you're going to go into Aquarius. And you, when you see the man bearing the pitcher of water, you know the symbol for Aquarius is the only symbol on the astrology wheel that has a human form, humanoid form, carrying a pitcher of water. So there it is in the Bible in one of these stories that came from this council of Nicaea, Nicaea, Nisha, whatever you want to call it. And they said, Master, what do we do when you're gone? Well, look for the man bearing the pitcher of water and go to his house. Houses are called the signs. They're roughly 2,000 to 2,100 years long. And we've just ended Pisces and we're going into Aquarius. That's why I chose my name for my channel, uh, Alex Aquarius. I'm pouring the knowledge out to you from what I'm finding on the Internet and I'm sharing it with you. That's the water from the pitcher. In my uh, personal revelation or opinion, if you want to call it that, let's see. The expurgatory index. As was the case with the New Testament, also were damaging writings of the early church fathers modified in centuries of copying, and many of their records were intentionally rewritten or suppressed. Adopting the decrees of the Council of Trent, the church subsequently extended the process of erasure and ordered the preparation of a special list of specific information to be expunged from early Christian writings. Vatican censors. Vatican archivists came across genuine copies of the fathers. They corrected them according to the expurgatory index. Index expurgatorix. Uh, wow, so they expunged records. I have to go back and read that. Let's see. Gospel authors exposed as imposters. 
There is something else involved in this scenario, and it is recorded in Catholic Encyclopedia. An appreciation of the clerical mindset arises when the Church itself admits that it does not know who wrote the Gospels and the Epistles confessing that all 27 New Testament writings began life anonymously. Church maintains that the titles of our Gospels were not intended to indicate authorship. Hmm. Therefore, they are not Gospels written according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, as publicly stated. So what is Christianity? The important question to ask is, if the New Testament is not historical, what is it? Dr. Tichendorf provided part of the answer when he said in his 15,000 pages of critical notes on the Sinai Bible that it seems that the personage of Jesus Christ was made narrator for many religions. Okay. Why there are no records of Jesus Christ? It is not possible to find any legitimate religious or historical writings compiled between the beginning of the first century and well into the fourth century, any reference to Jesus Christ and the spectacular events that the church says accompanied his life. I'm going to disagree with that because if you just go into Asia, starting with India and Persia, there are records of him. Known as Isa, the one who was crucified in Jerusalem. That was his title. That's what he was known by. Wow. So, folks, the point of this video is just to bring up the question. If, if you, I'm not going to say that everything I just read is absolutely true, but look at it. Look, if you're a truther and you're looking at my channel right now, I assume I don't have to explain to you what research is and truth. If you want to still be Christian and thump your butt, you know, there's some vigilant uh, people out there. I'm not going to name some channel. And they go into quoting this thing. The Bible says now word for word in here. It's right there. Look at that. I can open this Bible and I've got Mark Scripture. I can just flip it open. Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And so they are. They which testify of him. St. John 5.35. It's got to be true because it's in here. It's in here. But look at the origin of the book. The same people, if you're a truther, you're talking about the Illuminati today, the Club of Rome, the Sovereign Districts, the Vatican, the City of London, Washington, D.C., the Red Dragons, the Black Nobility. Um, all of these topics come up like who's running the planet today and where are we going, New World Order. Uh, one religion, one faith, the Pope, you know, all that coexist. Um, these are the people that gave you the Bible. Okay, it's, it's the same club of Rome and England that gave you the book that we thump on today as Christians and say every word in here is the word of God. Just think about it. Before you accept that and say that all the time, just think about it. Anyway, look up the uh, article here. Uh, let me go up to it. Let me give it to you again. It is the book by Tony Bushby, The Bible Fraud, from Joshua Books at www.joshuabooks.com. All right, everybody. So that's all I have to say. I'm, uh, I'm Bible thumping today. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you learned a little bit about the Council of Nicaea, Constantine, where the Bible came from, its origins, how many scrolls and texts, how many gods, how many fights. There even, were even people that died in that council over what was going to go on in the Bible. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Please hit like and subscribe. Ring the bell so you have notifications. And I will see you next time on the Plain Mundane Show. Good night.